Welcome to the Hope Growth Science Symposium webinar series of three webinars. This is the second one. Um, first of all, I just want to acknowledge again the sponsorship of uh, Standard Bank. Thanks very much for that. We're very grateful for the sponsorship. Today's webinar will focus on climate change and the guest of this morning will tell you more about that and especially on the impact on our industry is uh, Professor Stephanie Mitchley. Now she's very well known to all of you. Um, Stephanie has been done, uh, has been in our industry for a long time. She knows the fruit industry. She's been uh, a lecturer and a professor at the part of horticultural science uh, for a long time. She's still an extraordinary professor at Stellenbosch University within the same department. And nowadays, Stephanie is also a scientist within the climate change and risk um, assessment group of the Western Cape Department of Agriculture at Elsenburg. She's conducted numerous reports or studies and reports for various government departments um, for, for different countries um, in Southern Africa. Um, and there's probably nobody else who knows or actually knows climate change and can relate better to, to the fruit industry than Stephanie. She's recently conducted a project for, for Orgro. Um, it was a funded project looking at what we can expect in terms of climate change in the fruit production regions and how it might affect us. And that's what she's going to tell us about today. Um, it will be, it will be a, quite a few slides, um, but such is the nature of the data. It is actually quite, quite um, information dense, uh, but I think it should be very illuminating to all of you. Before we kick off, just a couple of house rules and an announcement or two. Um, I just want to remind everybody to keep your microphones muted and your video is switched off. There will be opportunity for questions. We'll allow questions in the middle, halfway through um, Stephanie's uh, uh, webinar and then right at the end again. And we would invite you to please um, type your questions in the chat box and then, then we'll address them when there's opportunity. Just a second announcement is, we're currently experiencing load shedding in Stellenbosch. The building where we're in at the Agrihub at Valkofalling's rental farm does have a generator. So we do have power, but it might happen that ESCOM's power come back on before we're done, in which case we'll probably drop away for a minute or two. So I would invite you, if that happens, uh, run off maybe, grab a cup of coffee and join us again then within five minutes when we'll be back live um, most likely. Okay, so that's it for the um, announcements. And we're getting going with the webinar. Stephanie, please tell us a little bit about the project. What did it entail? Um, what was it about? What did you set out to try to achieve? Thanks, Vian. Good morning, Vian and uh, the participants. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, um, the project was really the objective was to model and uh, map and then summarize what climate change means for the fruit industries, uh, specifically cone and stone industries in South Africa. And so we wanted to make sure that information is made available on the subject to the growers, to the industry that is science-based, um, that shows, you know, is, is very heavily based on data, good data, and then the models that show us what the future could look like. And so we compiled this over two years. Um, and I'd like to just acknowledge my uh, collaborators, Professor Roland Schulze and Nick Davis, who are both in Kozuru Muto, and I hope, I hope they're both with us today as well. Should be listening in. And if they don't I guess they will be. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'd just like to thank also there were members of the industry who workshopped um, some of the work with us um, at two, um, two events, and that was really, really helpful to guide us as to what kind of variables we need to be modeling and and mapping. So that was very thank you to those people. Okay. Now Stephanie, I understand there's various models that one can use when, when you model climate change. Um, and the outcomes can obviously depend quite a bit on, on which of those one uh, which of those one used. Um, how did you go about in deciding which models to, to, to use? Can you maybe explain a little bit for, for, for the audience what you did? Yes. So without going into the detail of climatology and then how these you know the detail of the models, I just want to point out that um, the, the international or the inter intergovernmental panel on climate change puts out these big reports every few years. And so what they do is all the climatologists who are working in this field um, internationally have different models. And there are many, many, probably about 30 different models that are used nowadays. So the one thing is that we have this range of different models that capture the climate in different ways. And the other point is that we then use scenarios to try and picture what we call a plausible future. 
um, because no model is perfect and no model will perfectly capture our climate and, and what will happen. So we're using these scenarios. So for example, if you look at the slide now, if you look at the red lines, those are all the different what we call uh, global circulation models that have been using what we call the, the scenario called the RCP 8.5, which is the worst case scenario. So if you look at the thick red line that goes all the way to the top, basically this, this slide shows um, greenhouse gas emissions, the rate of emissions on the y-axis, and then over time, um, and you'll see the black line at the beginning is the historical data, that's what we've measured, that's where we are currently, and then the colored lines are going into the future. Um, and so the red lines show the worst case scenario future. Um, you'll see the black line in the middle is, uh, and etc. So what we really want to do is end up on the blue line, which is where we would keep warming below preferably 1.5 degrees Celsius and maximum 2 degrees Celsius. All the other scenarios basically don't get us there. Um, at the moment, we are still very much on that red line. Um, and so what I want to point out is that for this study, we, the, you know, the climatologists when they model, they, they use different RCPs. But for this particular one, we're only presenting the 8.5 because that is what we're currently on our way towards. Um, hopefully we're not going to, it's not going to be that bad, but we'll, yeah. So that is the one we're using. And then also just to point out that um, the three timelines that we're using, uh, that we used in this study is first of all the historical, which is the blue line the arrow on the left-hand side uh, that is measured. Um, and then we've got two future time periods. The one is the 2030s, which is more the near term. And then one is the middle of the century around about the 2050s. So, and, and when I, it's very important to, when I show the maps, just to point out that the maps are always a, a, a median of several different global circulation models. Um, and they're usually for the middle of the century. Um, and they are just something to, to get us thinking about what could happen. It doesn't mean that necessarily it's going to end up like that. Um, so we need to be careful of interpreting them. But it, it, it shows us where we need to be adapting and, and making plans. Okay, thanks, Evie. So just if I understand correctly, so um, we on that red line still and uh, that's the yeah, and that's the wonderful model. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I mean, hopefully, as the governments around the world start making pledges as to how they're going to reduce their emissions, the idea is that we will start going down to the black line and hopefully into the yellow line, and the, the ultimate aim is to end up at net zero. Um, but Good. we don't know if, if that is going to happen. But one plan for the worst, expect the best. Yes, I guess. <laughs> Okay, uh, and this slide really is just showing you the, the, the just two sets of models that uh, Professor Roland Schulze and Nick Davis used for the modeling. Um, I'm not going to go into the details there, um, but for rainfall and runoff and stream flow, we use a very, very new one that's just, uh, just become available. So we have more confidence um, in those models now. But um, just to say that in both these sets of models, there is much more agreement between the models around temperature and the projections of temperature and temperature related parameters than there is for rainfall. So we need to be really, really careful when we look at the rainfall projections mm -hmm. because the models don't always agree. There's some models that would show drying, there's some that would show wetting, some in the middle. And so in a perfect world, we would show all of those different outcomes, but it becomes a bit complicated. So we still show the median, uh, but just to, to make people aware that, um, especially in the nearer term, the next 20, 30 years, it's, it's not going to be as clear cut as definitely decreases in rainfall increases. It could just be a change in variability. Um, and then after that, we start going into probably decreasing rainfall across the country. Well, there seems to be agreement that some of the weather patterns are changing though, in terms of where the high pressure systems are localized and the low pressure systems. Yes, there's evidence that the, the rain bringing frontal systems in the southwest or the winter rainfall area, that those are being pushed southwards, polewards, um, that is already being seen um, and that is also what the modeling tells us is that in future we're expecting more of that to happen that the fronts just don't make landfall um, yes. okay thanks Stephanie and so the carbon dioxide is going to increase it's increasing what's the implications for us in terms of temperature um, and temperature changes that we can expect and rainfall changes you know even despite the variability what is being predicted all right, so temperature, as I said, is, um, is fairly straightforward um, because we have been warming. There's very clear evidence that the whole world as in Africa has been warming significantly. And in the future, this is just going to continue. And so if we look at these maps now, um, and I'm not going to look at the detail and, and the legends and so on, but just an overview of what we've seen here. The top left-hand map is the historical pattern of mean annual temperature for the Western Cape. And I could just mention that um, we focused on the Western Cape mostly um, because 80% of the 
fruit is grown in the Western Cape, but then of course we, we're also looking at the whole country, and I'll come to some of those maps just now, but for some of these I'll just show the Western Cape and the lump roof. Yeah, I do know that you've got the lump roof there yes. right on the, on the <laughs> edge. Yeah. We extended the lump roof to include the eastern part, which is actually the Eastern Cape, so we, you can see the whole lump roof thing. But just to, to summarize, I mean the left top map just shows the current temperature regime, uh, you'll see the colder areas in the Boca Felt and then up the West Pacific it's really hot. Um, and then the right hand top map is, is what that looks like in the future. So you can still see a lot of yellow on the high line areas, the mountain ranges. Um, you'll see the warmer areas getting significantly warmer. Um, but the difference between the historical and the future is what you see in the bottom map. And you'll see that the blue areas of the southern parts are much milder warming. Um, so probably one and a half degrees warming going into the future, and then the yellow is a bit more, and then the more serious warming as we go inland in, into the middle, um, into the end of the country, uh, the, those Karoo areas. So it's not going to be the same everywhere, um, and especially yeah, the southern parts are going to be not as badly affected. And then if we look at um, a little bit more specifically, because we shouldn't really just look at annual temperature or any parameter, we need to look at it seasonally and possibly even monthly. Um, and so these two maps just show the maximum temperatures, mean maximum temperatures in, ju in January uh, is the top row and the bottom row is the minimums in July. So that captures our two, the winter season and the summer season. Um, and you'll see that the left hand graphs are what it currently looks like. So the dark reds are where you get very hot Januaries, um, yellows are the cooler Januaries. And then the right hand graph at the top shows how that could change in the future, what the modeling tells us. And then once again, we've seen um, more heating, more really hot Januaries in the inland, not so much on the coastal areas. And then in July, it's the same bottom left and the bottom right graph. Um, we'll see that there is also warming. There's this particular outcome of these models shows that it's maybe not as much as the, as the maximum in, in, in summer. But certainly in all, through all the seasons, we're expecting this one. I show the seasons, Stephanie. I know people are sometimes concerned about you hear people you know, anecdotally remark that this autumn's become longer and springs have become, you know, or summer's become longer. And is that, is that true? Does the data back that up? Yes, the data does back that up because, as, as I said, all the months have been warming. And so what's happening is that the, the warm season from spring to late autumn um, has been getting warmer and, and so that season has been lengthening. Mm -hmm. So we could say that for many crops, the growing season length, if it's a summer growing crop, is extending, is, is, so especially in the later part of the season in the Western Cape, we're seeing that um, the March, April, May temperatures are really leading to a, a much later close of the, of the warm and the growing season. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, and then if you look at rainfall, um, as I said, uh, we need to just be aware that not all the models show this pattern, but in general, they show drying on the western side. So if you look at the top left graph there, that is the current rainfall mean annual rainfall pattern across the province. Um, and you'll see the fruit areas are generally in areas with a darker blue, and that's where the rain resource, the water resource is. Um, and then if you look at the top right, that is the projected change from the historical to the future, 2050s. Um, and that is the change in millimeters at the top right, and then at the bottom is the change as a percentage of the historical rainfall. And you can see that it varies quite widely across the province. So the western parts, the winter rainfall area, uh, as I said, uh, all the global models really agree that winter rainfall region, or Mediterranean climate regions tend to be show uh, drying in the future. Um, but then as we go towards uh, more rainfall throughout the, the year and, and then going into the summer rainfall areas of the Karoo uh, in the northeast, we see that there could even be some wetting, some areas that, that could get wetter. And in fact, the data for the last 50 years, the rainfall data um, shows already significant wetting patterns in the eastern, the northeastern parts of the province and mm -hmm. the eastern Cap. So, um, yes, so it, it will be quite varied and we'll have to, and then of course, areas in the center where we, we may not get any change at all. But having said that, we need to also be careful, as I said, of the seasonal and the monthly changes. So the way the rain, the rain falls is going to be really important, even if the annual rainfall doesn't change. Yeah, this is a little bit disconcerting, I think one's going to say, and I guess the one will have to plan for future, even if it doesn't happen, but there's a likelihood that it will, and then one's going to plan for it, and I guess we'll probably will become more reliant on some areas on, on groundwater. Um, so we'll probably need to start looking into that. Yes, our water resources are going to become severely limiting in some areas, probably, uh, and groundwater is going to become much 
bigger part of, of, the, of the water resources, and, and, but, but used sustainably. And uh, we don't have enough data and information on, on that really. What does this slide show us, Stephanie? So this slide is just to make the point that uh, you know rainfall is so variable, and it's that variability that is important in farming and agriculture. So we need to be aware of how what the variability is from year to year in rainfall, and also from season year from within seasons. Um, and the Western Cape already has relatively high variability of rainfall. So if you look at the top left there, the, the, the light pink areas is where the variability is a bit lower, so twenty percent. And then as you go into the dark red areas, we get a very, very high um, interannual variability of rainfall, what we call the, the CV percentage, up to 60%. And so it's the, it's the more arid areas, as we know, that have very, very variable rainfall. And then if we take that into the future, the top right hand side, we see that possibly this could change a little bit. Um, the, the, it's just one to three percent, so it's, it doesn't look like a massive change, but we should be aware of the fact that even that variability could change uh, and it could be different in up the west coast compared to the east side of the province. Okay, um, so this is mean data of course Stephanie and, and you've also alluded to it that one should look at sometimes also the extremes and so on. So what, what is expected in terms of extremes? You know we, we're looking at extreme temperatures or floods or droughts, you know, what, what are we looking what is things looking like in that scenario? And then also, you know, obviously, you know, growers are concerned about hail incidents, you know, frost damage, those kind of things. Yeah, I think it's, it's really important that I think in the fruit industry, the, the massive, the real impacts are going to be felt uh, around the extremes rather than the gradual changes. Um, I mean, the gradual changes over time are important for planning, but in terms of real, you know, hitting people's pockets, I think it's going to be those extremes. Um, and unfortunately for some of the, especially the rainfall, related extremes and the storms and hail and those kinds of events, the data is, is weak. We have weak databases around that. Um, we do know for sure that high rainfall days or days with extreme rainfall tend to be increasing. And that is across the globe, but also across South Africa and the Western Cape. And the models also say that the events with very high rainfall are going to increase in future. Um, if we look at low rainfall extremes, um, we also are expecting more longer dry spells, so fewer rain days, and then just days, many more days on end where there's, where there's no rain, um, and then probably a high probability of drought in, in the Western Cape and, and across South Africa. Um, the models aren't very clear on that yet, but it looks like it's something that, that uh, we should be prepared for. And then if we look at wind and storms, uh, we have the models really don't capture storms or very localized uh, those kinds of extreme events very well and the, the data is scarce as well but what we are expecting is increasing um high, sub subtropical high pressure systems combined with more intense inland heating and so what we think is that in the summer rainfall areas um we could see these systems strengthening and especially the southeasterly winds strengthening in future um, and then if we look at hail uh, and i know this is of really great importance to many uh, production areas across the country and also the Lundkloof, um, so once again, the local effects are, are so hard to model. Um, but what we could say is that um, the, the climate systems, the way we think that the climate systems are not going to change, um, the systems that could bring hail could become more frequent, more intense in future. So in areas that already receive hail, um, we could see, especially in summer rainfall areas, where it usually comes with thunderstorms, um, certain factors that then give rise to hail, those kinds of factors could could become more frequent and so we could maybe expect more hail in some areas but it's very very hard to pinpoint where and how and how much that's uh, interesting we recently visited the long cliff and some farmers they remarked that they perceive that they get more hail than in the past you know growers have been farming there for 40 odd years 50 years um but i guess you know for for real term data well, maybe we should talk to the insurers <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah. yes data, data i mean our weather stations don't measure hail yeah. and and yeah. it's something that farmers keep records of and uh, as you said uh, where it's important for business but it's yeah it's something that it's it's a, it's a gap in our knowledge of trying to to model and, and predict what's happening in the future Stephanie, so then there's other extremes, there's excessively hot days, um, excessively cold nights, um, those are also of concern to growers. Yes, I think um, because of the warming, um, cold nights are going to become fewer mm -hmm. and less cold. So maybe okay. that's a good thing. And I'll come to that when I talk about frost later. But um, annual days where it's very, very hot, um, and we just take as a cut of 35 degrees Celsius. Um, 
In some areas, it could already be 32, or it could be 38 in warmer regions. But just, just, just to be consistent, we use 35 degrees. And then we look at what the risk is currently, what the risk is in the future, and those are the two top graphs there, and then the change at the bottom. And if you look at the change graph, the yellow areas is where you could have maybe up to 10, 12 more days over the whole year of, of those uh, very high temperatures. And then as you go into the darker orange and into the red, the red actually shows increasing a number of hot days, uh, 20, and in some cases even going up to 40 or 50 additional days um, in the future. So I think it's something to, especially in food production, um, you know, starting to talk about sunburn and, and loss of or red color development potential in apples, those are all things that are you know, related to, to very hot days. Yeah. Maybe I, I can just show you the next slide is the modeling we did in this particular project on sunburn. Um, so what we took is what we know about the factors, the climate factors that give rise to conditions that could lead to sunburn. And we, we modeled that historically in the future in the middle there and then the change on the right hand side. And I'm just showing the January and February graphs. We did this for every month in the growing season. Um, January and February is, is uh, where we would expect to see the biggest um, increase in risk maybe and we do see that. If you look at the graphs on the right hand side, the blue areas is where the risk is relatively small. So maybe two additional months um, in January and February. But then as you go into the oranges, the reds, and I'm looking particularly at the Berg River uh, Valley and, and going up north into the west coast. And then some parts of the little Karoo as well for, for production regions. That is, I think, where, where the risks could be higher, up to five days per month. Um, and yeah, but I, I just need to point out that I'm generally from February onwards, we start seeing a, a reduction in this additional risk, except in some areas we see March and April continuing high additional risks, um, especially I think it was in the series Kalbukafalt uh, area, where those areas, if you look at the late, the late harvesting apples, maybe would be at, at higher risk, yes. even, even at the end of the, of the summer in, in autumn. Yeah, that concur with, with what we've heard from some of the growers this year. Again, there's been a, a late sunburn here in the Kobolka Felt. Um, so, um, yes, there's definitely, I mean, that's also the observation from industry. It seems to be a, the risk seems to be increasing later, you know, late into the, into the harvesting season. That, yes, that, that seems to be the case. It's already happening and then also in the future as well. All right, okay. So yeah, I don't know if you at this point maybe want to say, but you've already mentioned that frost will be there, Stephanie. Um, yes, um, we also modeled frost. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to show all the maps now, but really we, we looked at the thresholds of zero degrees, minus one degrees, and minus two degrees, mm -hmm. and what is the historical risk, um, and then how what it looks up in the future. And as we would expect with the warming uh, across the province, the frost risk is significantly reduced. Um, but that's not to say, in all those categories, all those temperature thresholds, but that's not to say that it's completely eliminated. Yeah. And I think the danger lies in becoming mm -hmm. complacent and saying, you know, we're not going to have any more frost in 20, 30 years because those events could still happen, especially late frost. Right. Um, and here, yeah, if you look at what happened in Burgundy this year in the wine growing areas in France, they had a very warm March, everything started. Mm. You know, mm. bad break and flowering, and then they got hit with this terrible late frost over two, three days, a uh, month later, and just caused huge destruction. So we need to be very, very vigilant uh, around frost. But I think it's it's probably good news that in, in many of the areas that are currently at a lower risk, we could probably eliminate okay. frost. Yeah. yeah, I understand that um, the observation in many parts of the world, especially in the temperate climates, being that phenological stages as you know they've advanced. And, and that obviously it creates a risk of, you know, of, you know, so frost, the risk of frost might decrease, but if your phenological stages are earlier, flowering becomes earlier and so on, then that might again come yes. to, you know, become productive. Yes. Uh, so what the modeling doesn't do yet, uh, it's a bit more complicated, is to also start modeling the phenological changes mm -hmm. together with the, the weather changes yes. and then overlaying that. And we haven't done that yet. I think that'd be a very nice future study to do that. Yeah, um, um, Esme, Dr. Esme Lowe yesterday remarked about the phenophase project that they've got in the progress funding and where we're following outbreak um, performance um, over time and trying to, 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 to link it to, to, to chill models. But, you know, the intention is that that becomes a long-term study where one can over time see how outbreak patterns might change, you know, in advance and so forth. Um, there's opportunity for questions now. I don't know if anybody in the audience have 
got questions, and you can just use the chat box. It's a good place to maybe just take stock of what's been said up till now. So Stephanie has presented to us all the um, the scenarios in terms of changes in temperature, changes in rainfall, all those kind of things. Next on, we'll move into you know, I mean, for really good sunburn and frost, but we we'll look at further indications for for industries. Um, if there's any questions at this point in time? Also, I just want to. Um, apologize for any side effects from outside. We are on a working farm here at the Valka Farm Experimental Farm. And our colleague downstairs, who's a wheat breeder, is quite busy sowing his seed and preventing the guinea fowl from eating all his seeds. Um, so if you hear the hot noise, um, yeah, please, yeah, please accept our pardon for that or our apology. Any questions at this point in time from anybody? You're welcome to use the chat box. If there's no questions, and I've been asking all the ones I've got, um, so then we'll, if there's no questions, we'll just move on. Stephanie, looks like, looks like we can move on. If there are any questions coming in the meantime now, we'll handle them at the end. Okay, Myra, I think you can go back to, to sharing. Thank you very much. At this point, I also want to thank Marnu and, and Tia sitting here at the back. You can't see them, but they're making sure that everything works fine. Um, uh, Marnu is looking after the slides and Tia is looking after the, the webinar itself and the Zoom link. Okay, good. I think we can we can get going again. So Stephanie, um, let's look, let's start to look a little bit at the impacts. And the first one would be the red color. Um, I know you guys modeled it. Um, what did you see? Okay, so we modeled it using research that has been done in the Western Cape for probably over 20 years now. Uh, on what are the climate conditions? that we need for red color to develop in red apples. Um, and, um, and it's also backed up by some studies done in Australia. And so we, we, we've got a fairly good handle on, you know, the coal that is needed to start the process of the red color development and then the actual synthesis, which means warmer temperatures. And if we look at that and we model it, um, the historical is, is on the left-hand side there, um, and then the change is on the right-hand side. And I've shown it for, separately for March and April. And what you'll see is in March, historically, those red areas, those are the colder areas, go Bockerfeld, apples can start colouring up uh, much earlier, already in March. But even in EGBV, in El Grabo, and even the light of already several days in March where apples could start uh, developing red colour, we know that. Um, and then if you look at the right-hand side for March, that is the change. And so when you see going into the blues, and then especially the dark blue, that is where we see a greater reduction of the number of days that would be conducive to red color development. And we see quite a nice or big blue patch there um, in the book of Hulk, which is concerning that in March we'll lose, lose many days there that are conducive, but there'll still be days available to, for red color to develop. And then if you look at the bottom, um, you'll see that in April, that's really when, when there are many, many more days that are conducive to red color. That's where the first when you know, cold weather starts coming into the Western Cape, um, and you'll see it's, it's many days that are 20 days or more in April that are conducive. And then as we go into the future, we'll see those blue areas um, moving also into the EGBB area. Um, and so overall, we see in, in both of those months uh, quite significant decreases. Um, and then if we go into even more detail, I'm going to show you. What we did was we, we didn't only look at um, South Africa or the Western Cape, but we actually modeled specifically the 11 poem and stone fruit areas across the Western Cape. And I'm just showing you the three main apple regions here. The top one is EGBB, middle one is Ceres, and then bottom is Lumpcliffe. And the left-hand side again shows the number of days conducive to red color, and you'll see that lovely brown patch in the Bockerfeld showing that many, many days conducive to, to red color there. Historically, and even in the Western Lumpcliffe, you'll see the Western side there is dark red. Um, but then going into the future, which is the right hand column um, in 2050, going into yellows and, and light greens and dark greens. Um, and that shows what those future you know, conditions will be. So we're seeing a reduction of at least nine degrees in most areas and in the Book of Thought, even more than and Lumpcliffe, more than 15 days reduction in those kinds of days. That doesn't mean that there won't be red color. It just means that the, the chances become fewer. Um, and But I think in the cold areas, there will be still days, obviously, where in future, you know, red color can develop, but it will become a bit more tricky. Mm. Yeah. But we do have red clones. A um, mm. uh, concern would be color loss. And this season, even on apples, some color loss has been observed. Mm. 
So that will probably become a concern then, yeah. Yes. Um, Stephanie, in terms of, and that's maybe one of the most important ones, um, chill units. Um, we had the discussion yesterday about chill units and, and how to model them, but how do we expect them to change uh, into the future? Okay. Yes, I, was, I also listened in yesterday. It was a very interesting webinar, and it made me think that we also need to make some adjustments on, on this kind of modeling. Mm -hmm. um, we obviously need to wait for you know, tool models to be you know, further developed. Um, but what we did in our modeling was really just the basic infra tech approach. Um, and so we modeled 250 PCUs or chill units, 500 and 700. Um, and then I'm going to show this first of all for the whole country because I think it's also important to see how the whole country is going to change and other production areas as well, free state and so on. Um, the left hand side is really the historical um, situation and what you need to watch out there is the yellow color and the light orange. So the yellow color means that um, that threshold in chill units is reached in May um, on average um, and the the light orange means it's reached in June on average historically. So you'll see lots of areas um, the top there, 250, obviously a lot of areas already receiving 250 by May um, and in the mountainous areas by, by June, generally in the Western Cape as well by June. Um, if we go to the future, you'll see a really big shrinkage there of the colors that we want to see. So um, for 250 PCUs, we still see the mountain ranges in the Western Cape, yellow, up, uh, the Drakensberg escarpment, the high line areas of the Eastern Cape, the Free State, and so on. Um, so, yeah, but we're already starting to see that shrinking. And then if you look at the middle, which is the 500 PCUs, which is generally what you need for many, many apples, uh, we're seeing some dark oranges there. So, but what we're showing is that where, for example, you would normally reach that in June, in future you would reach that by July, a month later. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, even only in, in, in August. Um, and then if you look at 700 PCUs, high chill varieties, there are not many areas where we're going to get 700 by July or even August in the future. And then if, just to show you that we actually model this for, for other provinces as well, where um, fruit is grown, citrus fruit. Top is Free State. Um, then we look at um, Malanga. Colors in Natal and Western Cape at the bottom. The left hand graphs the historical and the right hand graphs the future. So I mean the point is really just to say that you know there will be loss of chilling across across the whole country, all the regions. Um, but if you look at the future ones, there are still areas of dark blue. Uh, I haven't shown Eastern Cape, Eastern Cape um, for the high line areas there, the Drakensberg foothills and so on. You'll still see a lot of dark blue there. So there will still be areas that receive um, and kind of book of felt, so it's good. But, uh, definitely, you'll see in the future the dark blue there in the book of felt. Um, so I don't think one needs to be too concerned about chill units in the book of felt in the future. There might be certain years that become difficult, but on average, um, they should still get a mm -hmm. chilling thing. But it's the, I think it's the southern and the coastal ones that are a okay. real concern. Uh, so the areas that's low and already that yes. become yes. problematic. Okay. Um, right. Um, oh, okay, so you delve into the regions there. Yeah. Um, um, mm. I don't know if you want to see the detail yeah, let's, of this. Let's, let's, let's look at it. I, I know okay, from the questions that some people yeah, are asking about their regions. The one I'll just, maybe you can, Mara, you can maybe just go back to the, the previous slide. Um, this is EG Levy at the top, and you'll see, you know, the future going into the oranges and the, and the greens. And I've, and I've been conservative there. I'm only using 250 PCUs. Um, Mara, can we just go back to the, the previous one? There we go. Yeah. So if you look at Elgin and Crabeau, just 250 PCUs. Um, already starting to look at even patches in, in Elgin that are going green which means August. Uh, but if you look at EGV, a uh, series book of in the bottom there, most areas still receiving that kind of chilling by May, um, latest June, or areas of book um, So not too concerned there. But um, And then going into, I think for the stone fruit um, producers maybe of more interest is the Summerbosch and the Berg River Valley system, and then also the Breda Valley system, which is, uh, so the top one is the Berg Valley, and the bottom one is the Breda Valley, and we'll see that going into future, the Berg Valley looks like something we need to keep an eye on, um, even 250 PCUs not, not being reached until August, um, which for some of the, the medium till or higher till um, stone fruit could be, could be a real problem. But, uh, and then the bottom one showing the Breda, which is that uh, dark orange, which means July, so, Probably not too much of, of an issue for stone fruit then. Okay, then obviously the next one. So chill is a big one for us. Heat, obviously, and if we really handled heat, water. Mm -hmm. Because you know, a crop can't grow without water. What does what does the water availability look like? Um, you know, and how much 
and how much does evaporation, you know, is it said to increase? Water is probably the most, I mean, heat stresses is, and chilling is, is really important, but I think for the industry, water is, I think it's my biggest concern mm -hmm. going into the future because we are a water restricted area. And as you saw the rainfall projections, it shows that our big catchments could, um, could become drier and the dams possibly not fill up the way they used to. Um, and so I, I just need to say that again, once we, all of these, the, the stream flow, uh, you know, the runoff, the groundwater recharge, what is available to, to the industry in terms of water um, is based on the rainfall projections. And as I said, we need to be careful about those. Um, but be that as it may, um, if, if we look at stream flow, for example, um, and the, the top shows basically that the dark blue is where we have high stream flow. You can see the Berg River system, the upper Breda system, lots of water there. Um, but if you look at the change, um, the, the biggest changes are, especially if you look at that Breda, that the Berg River system, we could see, because of the rainfall projections that we saw, we could see um, much lower stream flows in future there. Uh, so that's the absolute change in the top right, and then as a percentage of, of historical stream flow at the bottom. It's the western side of the, of the Western Cape, real concern. We could see increasing stream flow in some areas going towards the east, where we might have a little bit more summer rainfall in future. Um, areas of the Karoo, um, and then of course big patches in the middle where things might not change too much. Um, but I think in the western side where we are, you know, we have the big dams, uh, but the city of Cape Town and other mm -hmm. settlements, basically other towns competing with water. Um, we, may, we need to be really, really, we do a lot of urgent water planning, I think, um, as a, as a, you know, everybody in the whole province, but also as, a, as an industry to really think carefully about um, how to use water, water more efficiently. Um, and um, yeah, if I can just show one more, irrigation demand is going to increase. If we look at uh, changes in potential evaporation, um, the right-hand side is, is once again the change. And you'll see the dark orange areas is where we think the potential evaporation could increase uh, a bit more. Um, but on average in the fruit growing areas, we could expect something like about 100 millimeters per year increase in potential evaporation. And that has implications for irrigation demand. And, and so some of the studies that have been done on irrigation demand show probably between a 5 to 8% increase in water demand for the same kind of production level. Yeah, obviously this is quite disconcerting, Stephanie, um, but I guess with this not being our switch, you know, and, and try to say it's not going to, you know, ignore, ignore what's in front of us. So it's probably going to be one of our big challenges going forward, how to plan around water availability. And there's parts of the world, I guess, where people have done a lot with even less water. Um, and uh, so there's stuff that can be done, but obviously require, you know, cooperation, collaboration, very good planning. So, okay, now, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's still better to know what we can expect. Sure. So in terms of, in summary, you know, if you look at all, everything you've shown us, um, all the data, all the projections, so what are we looking at in our different regions, you know, okay. if you have to summarize? I think it's really important to make the point up front that the future looks very different in different regions, depending on what the, the current climate is and then how things pan out in the future. Um, and so I think it's important to, to think about shifts rather than you know, doom and doom scenario everywhere. <laughs> um, what, what we've done is for the study, we just did a summary of certain regions. So a region that I would call Southwestern Coast, which includes EGBB and Southwest West and the Southern End area. Um, and uh, so what we can basically say that, say, I think this region is going to suffer most from loss of chilling um, and, and day is conducive to red color development. I think those are the two main ones. The other ones like evaporation so on are going to be less significant, really hot days, less significant than some of the other areas. So I think that's the main one to keep in mind, especially when it comes to you know, choice of cultivars um, and so on. Uh, if we look at the northwest and high line region, which includes Ceres Bokerfeld, um, in the middle it's Wolsey Tilbach, right hand side is Bekitbach. Um, they, they, they're quite different, um, but in the future it looks like um, we're going to have a lot of heat stress, more heat stress in those areas. The Bokerfeld are remaining very suitable for pump and stone fruit, but then if we look at Wolsey, Bekitbach, one needs to look very carefully about the future there for, for pump fruit. Um, and increasing evaporation, I think, is also a, an issue in, the, in this area. Um, if you look at the lung growth, um, winters and summers really getting quite a lot warmer, um, especially in the western part. Um, 
And then, yeah, with summer temperatures, we're seeing an indication of, of increasing heat stress there. And then, of course, that leads to fewer days for red color and reductions in chilling. But in general, I think um, the lung cloth are not looking too bad in terms of um, evaporation, for example, um, and chilling. I think what, we, what, what is left in the future would still be sufficient for you know, genetically suitable cultivars of you know, both palm and unstung fruit. Um, and then if you look at the clan karua, um, some serious warming projected for parts of the clan karua with some areas just becoming really, really hot. Um, but yeah, potential evaporation, maybe not as, not as much as I would have thought. Uh, it, there will be a high demand for water, which could be of concern, um, especially if stream flows um, that are really low, um, be, you know, decrease even more. So that's, that's something to look out for. Um, and in the southwestern river valleys, which is the Berg system and the, and the Breda system, the Berg system really becoming uh, probably much warmer. Uh, and especially Wellington northwards, you see the dark brown patches there northward in the middle and lower Berg system. Um, I think that's an area that might stop you know, getting problems. Um, and then probably more dry spells. This is the area where we're seeing the rainfall projections showing quite a bit of drying, um, dry spells, um, years where there's not enough water and then high increases in evaporation as well. Uh, the bread are maybe not, not as bad. Yeah, so that's the summary. Stephanie, I know you're still doing some modeling um, for spring temperatures, I think, in mm -hmm. terms of our mining for set. set. Um, if you don't, maybe we just want to say something about yes. that. So we've just started a, a new project with the same team of collaborators, Professor Schultz and, and Nick Davis, where we're looking very specifically at the period at, towards the end of winter, the end of, of dormancy and um, you know, bud burst going through into probably fruit set. So the early season, the early growth um, period, where I think in the last 10 years, there've been many, many seasons with real stressful situations, uh, very, very erratic, you know, heat stress in the middle of August or September, followed by really cold weather and rain. And so very unpredictable weather. And what we're trying to figure out um, is historically, what was the risk for that kind of unpredictable weather and, yeah, and then how could that change in future and where, where are the areas that, that could be most at risk for, for both stone fruit and plant fruit. It'll be interesting because growers have experienced the poor sets and plums of a, a season or two ago. That's the kind of question they've got. Mm -hmm. And interesting enough, when the project was initiated and we started to look at red colour and chill and all these things, we didn't thought of think of looking at spring temperatures mm -hmm. and until we, we had that severe heat and mm -hmm. poor set. Um, Stephanie, so where from here? What's next? What should we do? Um, you know, what's the next steps in terms of coping, adapting, mitigating climate change? Mm -hmm. So I think the first step for, for any grower um, is, is just to be armed with enough, you know, the correct information mm -hmm. for this particular area, uh, because it's it's not going to be the same everywhere. So yeah. no understanding your, your microclimate on your farm. And, and I, I think it's fantastic that growers are starting to put up their own weather stations, for example. Mm -hmm. And really tracking and monitoring what goes on on, on your farm. And um, the other thing is just to to start planning. Um, and you know, choices that are made now in terms of what to plant, what to take out, and what to plant are going to have repercussions all the way through. You know, this period that we're talking about, the next 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. um, and making sure that the right, um, you know, in terms of tool um, requirement, in terms of you know. You know, high colouring red, red varieties, for example, um, or even shifting fruit type. So, if you're in an area where you think it's going to become really high risk for apples overall, you know, shifting to stone fruit, um, yeah, make, just making something to think about those kinds of decisions. And then also around water resources. I think just good planning for future um, risk mitigation around water is going to be. Yes, I agree with you. I think there's a, a lot that's in the growers and in you know, the East Domain, you know, in terms of planning on farm. I, I guess we will need a little bit of help as where you know it gets around to regional level and in particular relating to water. Um, so I think we're gonna to have to take each other's hands and do some work together. Um, yeah, so it's not all doom and gloom, I guess. It's definitely there's still plenty of opportunity and uh, um, you know and, and yeah, yeah, just talking about opportunity, mm. I think we haven't even talked about, for example, the Eastern Cape. Mm. So if we look at the southern part of the country and if we look at the high lying areas of, of the Eastern Cape, uh, the picture doesn't look so bad there. Mm -hmm. So there might be new areas opening up for certain fruit types, as right. long as there's a water development, I think, um, to support that. And there's good soils, we know there's good soils mm -hmm. there. But I think it's uh, 
it's worth for people who are thinking maybe of branching out into areas where mm -hmm. you know it's less stress, it's something to think about. Now, on Cliff, I've also seen a big increase in netting, uh, which obviously helps you reduce the risk of both sunburn and uh, um, high yes. So, uh, I think there's still probably quite a lot of growth can do. That's sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. I think we can take some questions. Some questions did come in, and some of them are just comments. Uh, Stephanie indicated, though, even though we equally deaf, um, I can still see a little bit better than her. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I might just read the question, Stephanie. I can, I can just make it up. Can you make it up? Yeah, yeah. So I'll just for the rest of the audience to presentation is quite relevant, useful for planning and rotation, and the work focus in the Western Cape. Uh, which other agencies available who are doing work for other provinces? Okay, so I think that the climatology is being done for the whole country mm -hmm. at quite a detailed level. So that is available. Um, in terms of the, the impact modeling that we did specifically for the fruit, um, we some of our parameters are chilling, I said, we actually did for the whole country. Um, but and, and actually the model, the modeling results are mostly available for the whole country. Mm -hmm. um, we have for now just cut them out for the Western Cape and Lunchloff, but it's certainly possible to you know, spend some time and, and doing it yeah. for other production regions as well. Yes, so we can expand. I think initially the idea was to go with the 80-20 principle, um, you know, with 80% or more of production in the Western Cape, that's where the focus was. But like Stephanie said, you know, we could definitely look at other regions too. Um, so we went through the maps pretty fast, yes, um, we had a lot, many of them to cover. Um, where can we get the data to have a closer look, you know, at the individual regions? Mm -hmm. So I think <clears throat> probably the best answer to that is that the, <clears throat> the, the project is now finalized. Um, it's been approved by Watergrow and all the maps are now basically available. Is that right? Yes, so I guess so if anybody wants access to the report, we can, we can forward the people. Um, and um, there will also be development of an app. Um, that's intended for the next financial year of Watergrow. So all the information will also be available on a web-based app. So it should be at anybody's uh, well, fingers. Yeah, and then hopefully over time one can just update that yeah. as new information becomes available. Good. Um, what is the resolution of the smallest unit or area used to compile these maps? Um, in other words, how zoomable are the maps? They are very zoomable, they are high resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can just say the modeling was actually done on, on a, a hydrological basis, so what we call the quinary catchments. Mm -hmm. So a quinary catchment, um, there isn't a, a set size for a quinary catchment, but they, I think there's over a thousand quinary catchments across South Africa, but it's it's really from at a catchment level. Mm -hmm. um, and it's some of them are, are quite small in areas that are that don't have mountains and you know more flat. Obviously your quinary catchments will be bigger, but um, it's 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 really high resolution. And it's um, you know, Professor Roland Schultz developed this model called ACRU, um, and and you know the methods that have been used here are uh, focused on, on doing it at, at that pretty high resolution. Good, Quinary that's stuff. good to know. So you can actually zoom in quite significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's also why, you know, the slides sometimes took a little bit of time to download. <laughs> <laughs> but just, just, a, just a, as a caution that when one does zoom in at very high resolution, just to be careful not to overinterpret oh, right. what yeah. you're seeing, because the colors are obviously uh, matched to your quinary, but mm -hmm. um, I think my, one, one needs to step back a little bit sometimes just to see what is the, the general trend and not get stuck in the very yes. local detail. Yeah. yeah, and then I guess there's probably some other tools that one can utilize if you're at a farm level, you want to plan according to terroir. I'm thinking specifically mm -hmm. terraclim, for example. Mm -hmm. So there are options of, of one on the plant that yes. level at yes. auto yeah. So we haven't taken into account very detailed terror kind of mm -hmm. information like, like slopes and mountains and you know that yeah, I think um, that's where which are comes from. Okay, with the terrain added, yeah. Okay, to what extent will incidence of oxidative stress occur earlier in the season, other than sunburn? Yeah, I, I would think that sunburn is probably the major oxidative stress that we do experience. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to give it a go, Stephanie? Um, I would say if there are, are serious heat waves uh, early in the season, um, that could put the tree as a whole under stress. Mm. But um, I would say the most sensitive part is obviously the, the young fruit, mm. not so much the leaves and the rest of the, you know, the vegetative structure. They can handle yeah. these kinds of situations pretty well. Uh, it's, it's the fruit that we're worried about and buds. I think really buds is, uh, you know, that, that September, October heat wave is what we don't want. Mm, yeah, mm, yeah. yeah, yeah. carbohydrate restrictions in the tree and then the fruit might mm. fall. Okay, um, 
Are you planning to look at changes in pest and disease pressure as well? Uh, that's a good question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we did actually model two moth pest species. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in the reports. So if anybody wants to go and have a look, it's there. It does show that it's obviously pest specific. It's every pest species has its own envelope or sensitivities mm -hmm. to temperature, humidity, and how they respond. So we would expect some pests would do better and some may do worse in future. Mm -hmm. So we can't just say give a blanket statement that all pests are just going to become more of a problem. Uh, we need to, to do it per, per species. Um, but it does look like some of the moth species um, could become you know, if they had one life cycle, so for example, historically, you might end up with one and a half or two life cycles in the future. Yeah. So the modeling does show that. But I think we need to do a lot more modeling on, on different uh, or other important pests in the industry, and that, that hasn't really been done yet. I know that my colleague, Matthew Addison, his co-author of, of, of researchers in the crop protection field, has done quite a lot of work also in insect physiology. Mm -hmm. So there is quite some information available on, you know, what the, you know, what, what the preferences of each insect is mm -hmm. in terms yeah. of all. You know, not by the victim. So it's definitely something one can zoom into more, I agree. Um, future climate scenarios do not replace interseasonal variability. Lessons learned during the recent hot and dry years are especially applicable to future planning. So that's a remark by Peter Johnson. Yeah, yeah I think the interseasonal variability is, is critical. Um, that will remain and could even become more problematic within mm -hmm. the, the longer term trends. Yeah. Um, and so that is something to really monitor carefully over the next 10, 20 years, uh, because I think that's where the main impacts are going to be. Thanks, Peter, for your relevant comment. Um, how does the future of poem for production look in the Grayton area? It was hard to see detail in the map. Okay, so the map is scalable um, and will be available so you can zoom in on your area. Stephanie can maybe also just, you know, general reply on your, on your question. So Brayton um, is, you know, similar to EGBB, it's a warmer area. Um, the, the futures, as I, as I said, for the whole southwestern region is really that the, the warming um, creates a high risk in terms of chilling um, and red color development. Um, and so I think, you know, it's similar to, to, great, uh, to, to EGBB, um, but I think if, if you want to see the details of, of well, what we're calling the Lofisar end, uh, production region, it's, it's probably better to actually look at the report center and zoom in on that and see what it looks like. Yeah, yeah and I think it's at that point one should also note, even within our warmer regions, there's areas that's cooler and areas that's warmer, and even in those warmer areas there, we we quite, quite, we're quite good at, at top food production. Um, I'm thinking particularly of the greater area that which I know, that I know quite well of, and there's some really good fruit production in that area, even though it is a warmer area compared to, let's say, Elgin or Fayetteville. Um, and, and if we imagine that, let's say, Elgin and Fayetteville in those areas might move closer to a greater than climate that still bodes quite well for those then, uh, because top fruit production remain possible, uh, maybe just with a little bit more, in, in, uh, you know, um, you know, a couple more things that the producer needs to do. Yeah, no, I agree with what you said around microsites as well. Yeah. So I think that area has microsites that are that are really um, like south-facing slopes mm -hmm. instead of east of the end mountains. Um, so those those will, you know, what we're showing is just kind of an average out. Um, so yes. if, but if you have sites up against the south-facing slope, oh, those will stay suitable for a much longer time. Yeah, that would be particularly the case in the official end valley where. I mean, you don't even see the production because it's already up in the cliffs. Mm. All right. Um, how up to date is the data used? Has it been updated since 2014? So the database is the one that Professor Rochelle has put together, um, the, the historical database. Um, and that goes, that needs to be updated again. It, at the moment, it goes to, to 2000. Um, but then the, the modeling um, yeah. is, it sometimes uses the, the older IPCC modeling uh, or GCMs, which is 2007 and 2014. Um, and what would be really good now is the next set of models that come out of, that are going to be available literally by I think next year. Um, so we have to keep updating the modeling, but it's a, it's a huge effort. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's also a huge effort to update the historical database to include the last decade or so. Um, you know, new data. So that, that needs to be done. Um, and it's, it's quite an important next step. Um, and you know, we need some resources for some climatologists to actually do that and, and see um, if we, you know, how the modeling evolves and, and if we get new messages coming from that. All right. 
Um, any further questions? So we've covered all the questions we've had. Um, any, anything else? Anything anybody wants to know? I can just say that the daughter is very well familiar and aware of the challenges in terms of climate going forward. And we are funding a significant amount of research on, for amongst other things, dormancy, chill models, um, sunburn, um, water, um, and the, you know, so those are the obvious focus areas anyways, in terms of what we're going forward. We'll be, we'll be embarking on a, on a foresight study this year, um, and uh, you know, with assistance with the Western Cape Department of Agriculture, um, we want to actually plan for the different scenarios in the future and climate and water will be at the forefront of that, I would imagine. Uh, so we're going to roll it out in the fruit industry and uh, um, the, intention is of, the intention of such a foresight study is that one can actually see how things might evolve in the future and areas, regions and, and, and grow bodies can plan then accordingly. Um, Stephanie is also busy working for us on a, on a on a, on a new project, on a climate strategy for, for the Western Cape and for the food industry. We're very fortunate and thankful that um, Western Cape Department of, of Agriculture is, is allowing her to continue with that study. In case it fits in with the work you're actually doing at yeah, Western Cape anyway, Stephanie. Um, and we're fortunate that she can follow up on this current study where she looked at, and she and the team looked at what can happen. Um, she says so she's following up in terms of what we can do about it. You know, what's things we can put in place what are, the, what are our options in all the different areas based on, on this data? Yeah, so we're going to have, have a series of workshops across all the food production regions, across the whole country, in fact. Uh, it'll probably be virtual uh, this, later this year for, and give, give producers and, and people in different regions a chance to voice you know, their concerns, their experiences, um, and what they would like to see in, in a strategy. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, then if there's no any further um, comments, then I just first of all want to thank our sponsor, um, Standard Bank again, um, and then also want to thank Stephanie, thanks for your time, your effort, and also um, uh, your, you know, well, not only just webinar, but also for investing in the industry through your knowledge and everything. I'm glad that there's a, the knowledge is also like yourself available. Um, we can go to, you know, we have difficult questions about climate, and I can see that you will be playing, you and Western Cape, department will play a major role going forward in terms of planning for for the future that awaits us thank thanks you very much. much okay thanks everybody thanks for your attendance um, and uh, those of you will visit us tomorrow again we'll talk about nets um, so yeah enjoy the rest of the day